So the details of the specific campaign have been leaked through an email. Um, Professor, can you unpack what exactly this means? Well, it's a couple of levels. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. The first is that uh, it's interesting the way in which this uh, story broke. And there are a couple of different leaks, as it were. The first was the nine-page document, which the Public Affairs Engagement US lobby group uh, put out, uh, proposing a way forward uh, as to how the draft IP policy would be opposed. Of course, there are many disturbing things about that which we will unpack in due course as well. But uh, and then, of course, there were the denials from various industry rep representatives saying that they had nothing to do with this, all of which, of course, have been blown out of the water completely because now we have the, the second leak, which is the email that was sent by the, I think, CEO of Merck, in which he makes reference to a December meeting and substantive agreements that have been reached. So that's the sort of background of, um, if, if you might like, subterfuge and conspiracy behind this. But to answer your question, what it means essentially is a delay and dilution of the reform initiative in this country. Uh, what these interest groups are seeking to do is to buy time to convince our legislators, to cons convince consumers, to convince the public generally that um, the reform process is actually not good for us. In other words, they want to turn public opinion against the government and against the people who are saying that this IP reform process is long overdue. And just a sort of final comment on that. At, at the heart of this, of course, is, is clearly naked self-interest. Um, I think the pharmaceutical companies in particular don't want to let go of the very easy ride they have in this country to getting their patents granted. Right? There's no examination system. Uh, they can get evergreening patents which go on forever. And the effect of all of that is that nobody is able to compete with them. And uh, the lack of competition means that prices remain high. Uh, having generics enter the market uh, serves us well because it means we as consumers, as the public, uh, can get cheaper prices, can get our medicines for uh, more cheaply. So that's at the heart of this. Lati, I'm going to take it to you now. Pharma, which is the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America and IPASA, who are the Innovative Pharmaceutical Association of South Africa, are outlined in the email as the main financial drivers behind this campaign. What benefits are they going to gain should this move forward? I think there's two clear benefits that um, pharma have by driving behind this campaign. Uh, essentially, if they keep the system as it is, which at the moment is a dream for the pharmaceutical industry because we are not examining any patent applications that come in. So if, if you put the right paperwork in uh, with your filing fee, you automatically get the patent. And uh, there are no checks on that whatsoever, which means that a, an excessive number of patents are being granted in the country, which means that they keep a monopoly on their products for a longer period of time, which means they can make a lot of money out of it. So money is one of the clear drivers behind them pushing for this reform. And on the other side of it, it clearly sets a fantastic precedent for the pharmaceutical industry. If they can stop the reforms from happening in South Africa, it sends a clear signal to the rest of the world uh, and the rest of the developing world not to try and implement these completely lawful um, flexibilities which are allowed under international intellectual property law to happen. So I'd say money and the precedent are the clear reasons that they're driving behind this. If I may just add one more thing there, um, Jennifer, that is that uh, in some uh, respects the pharmaceutical industry is a little bit on the defensive because of what happened in India. And as you might recall, in April last year, the Indian uh, High Court uh, passed a judgment in terms of which they said that the whole question of evergreening, you know, of uh, granting patents on minor improvements on medicine will not be allowed in Indian law. And that has had, had the effect of uh, making uh, the patent uh, sort of area for, for pharmaceutical companies a lot more tenuous. And I think they feel that they need to win back some of the ground. So they're kind of reeling from this. But of course, you know, with uh, the pharmaceutical industry as with most powerful, you know, moneyed interests, uh, they, you know, they get over one setback and they'll find another way of coming back and trying to reclaim the ground and to reclaim the initiative as it were. So I think that adds to the, what Lottie has been saying about what's in it for them. 
Great. And Lottie, I want to go back to um, the leaked documents that we were speaking about earlier. Um, they suggest that the greater protection of intellectual property will lead to increased foreign investment and greater economic prosperity. Do you think this is true? Yeah, this is an argument which is often used by the pharmaceutical industry that uh, stricter um, intellectual property in a country will actually increase the investment. But we've seen the exact opposite happening in South Africa. Since the adoption of this international intellectual property law in the country in 1997, there's been a steady decline in foreign investment in the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, 35 pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing plants have actually shut down and they've all moved their business to countries that have um, cheaper production and um, employment costs and have a different economic benefits. Um, so that's what we've actually seen happen. And on the other hand, the companies that are South African are all generic companies which are, which are being restricted from entering the market for a longer period of time because of the uh, patent laws that are currently in place. So it's the opposite that we've seen happening. Well, those are some big facts to unpack. Yusuf, did you have anything to add? This is an argument which is actually uh, often advanced by the uh, sort of innovator industry because uh, uh, we, we, you know, of course we're suspicious about their motives because we don't see the evidence. And the reality is that there's, and there's several studies which actually support this, that there's no you know, conclusive evidence to show that if you have stronger IP protection that you'll have a faster growing economy or anything of that sort. In fact, the evidence, all that the evidence shows is that the level of innovation that happens within a country uh, rises and accelerates with the higher level of economic development. So in a sense, you know, developing countries are really struggling to um, develop economically and to expect that they would um, you know, be able to innovate and benefit from strong IP is actually a, a bit of a misnomer.